You're watching The Context. It is time for our new weekly segment, AI Decoded. There's no better week to begin a segment on artificial intelligence than a week in which the world came together to understand what it truly is. Around 100 world leaders, tech bosses and academics have been meeting these past two days at Bletchley Park and... Judging by the reams of column inches the summit generated this week, there's clearly huge interest in what it is capable of, where it's taking us, and just as importantly, how we control it. Let me take you through some of the reaction in today's papers. The Financial Times lords the new Bletchley Declaration, signed yesterday by 28 countries, including China. The paper says that commitment must deliver a path forward that ensures AI is used in a human-centric, trustworthy and responsible way. The Times, though, picks up on a piece of research that underpins why the guardrails will be necessary. A group of scientists revealed that with a few simple tweaks to the AI code at Meta, the system was more than happy to instruct them on how to go about building a bioweapon based on the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. The Guardian picks up on the meeting tonight between Rishi Sunak and Elon Musk, the world's richest man, and... Tesla chief executive Elon Musk, who co-founded OpenAI, the company that developed ChatGPT. It was Musk who recently described AI as one of the biggest threats to humanity. And on the BBC News website, a poem created by ChatGPT, which was written in honour of the veteran codebreaker Betty Webb, now 100, who worked on Alan Turing's team at Bletchley Park to crack the German codes during World War II. We'll look a little deeper at those stories in a second, but let's begin with that chat between Rishi Sunak and Elon Musk tonight. Luckily for us, Priya Lakhani, who founded the AI platform Century Tech, is at Bletchley tonight. She'll be on stage, probably right now, introducing the Prime Minister. She's also going to be one of our regular experts in this slot, and a short time ago she sent us something from the venue. I'm Priya Lakhani, founder and CEO of the AI education company Century Tech. I'm in St. James's in London, where following the inaugural AI Safety Summit, which took place over the last two days, I'll be introducing the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, and Elon Musk on stage shortly, where they'll be discussing a broad range of issues, from AI and the wider technology landscape, to opportunities for economic growth and productivity. A little later this evening, I'm going to join Christian on the show and give you the lowdown of what was discussed. Yeah, we'll speak to Priya later in the programme. Hopefully, if they release it, we'll bring some of the best bits of that discussion. But here to take us through some of the big developments this week is Dr Stephanie Hare. She's a tech and AI writer, author of Technology is Not Neutral, a short guide to technology ethics. Great to see you, Stephanie. Um, can we start with this Bletchley Declaration? What is it and how open do you think this discussion going forward is going to be? Well... There's so much to say, so where to start? The first is that we've just concluded the two-day summit at Bletchley Park. 28 countries signed this declaration. What does that mean? It's a declaration of intent. It's not legislation, it's not regulation, it's not binding. What it is, is an intention to work together to test AI models, to report on national security risks and other types of risks, to create some AI safety institutes here in the UK and over in the United States as well. They're going to work with Singapore and to have some more summits. So the next one's going to be in South Korea in six months time. And then another six months after that, France. So it's kicking off a process more than answering any questions. Do you think it will define the guardrails? Will there be an international standard for how to control AI? I think the use of the word guardrails that you've just highlighted is really interesting. We use the word guardrails when we are not talking about laws, when we're not talking about regulation. So we're talking about voluntary commitments. Companies agree to share their models with the government, only the government of the United States and the United Kingdom at the moment, it should be said. So I don't know how comforting that is for everybody else around the world, right? And it's only these eight companies other ones, maybe not so sure. And we don't know what China's companies are doing. So again, it's all great, but it's not the sort of thing that should make everybody sort of sleep peacefully in their beds tonight thinking, ah, we've solved the risk of artificial intellig intelligence. We haven't. We've gotten some progress, but there's a lot more to do. Yeah, and it, it's stories like the one in the Times today that, that will probably alarm people. So the information scientists were seeking was for a bioweapon. In general, 
Stephanie, computer scientists would lean towards open source software. What the scientists in this story are saying and arguing is that the source code of the big AI systems has to be secure and secret. Can you explain why they think that's so important? Yes, so this is a raging debate within the AI community. Should we allow for source code, so being able to literally open up a company's code, which they might consider to be their intellectual property and thus a trade secret, so that it can be evaluated and maybe even shared not just with governments, but with external auditors, with other researchers? Or is that going to actually give power to potential bad actors? In other words, does it make us safer or does it make us at more at risk? There is no clear consensus on that. I can't give you any closure on that question tonight. We're still debating it. And some of the brightest minds in the field completely disagree. The thing that stuck with me, Stephanie, though, was this, this line from the scientists that the cost of making the meta system, of course, runs into the millions and millions of dollars. The cost of altering it, work that's already been done by not just these scientists, by, but by other individuals online, that's estimated at just a few hundred dollars. Um, yes. And, and if they can do it, then the fear would be that the, the malevolent actor could do it as well. Correct. So sometimes people have tried to compare artificial intelligence as a sort of technology that's as important as nuclear technology. But nuclear technology is actually very difficult for most people, you and I, companies, even most countries, to get in on, right? It's complicated, it's expensive, and you can control all the different components and monitor them. Much harder to do with artificial intelligence for precisely the reason you've just said. So if somebody's able to get in and potentially use that technology in a way that it wasn't intended, that's something that we need to be able to mitigate against. And right now, we can't. We'll see what Elon Musk makes of all this uh, in this chat tonight with the Prime Minister. But on the sidelines of the summit yesterday, Stephanie, um, there were comments carried in The Guardian today uh, in which he said, it's not clear at all that we can control such a thing, but we can aspire to guide it in a direction that is beneficial to humanity. Now, the Prime Minister had a session today with firms like OpenAI uh, and DeepMind to talk about state-backed testing and evaluation. Uh, th that seems to me to be the way the Americans are leaning with this executive order that President Biden signed on Monday. Do those solutions reassure you? It reassures me that we're talking about it openly and that so many countries are coming together and we're having a chat about it on the news right now because none of this was the case even six months ago and definitely not a year ago. So progress has been made. But again, the United States kind of crashed the party yesterday when uh, Vice President Kamala Harris announced all sorts of initiatives, including the creation of an AI safety institute in the United States. Now that's backed by something called the NIST. Um, that's really underfunded. It only has 20 employees, right? So for something that is supposed to be wow. keeping all safe, that's not very inspiring. So we're going to need to see a lot of money a lot of people, and we're going to need to see legislation. Even President Biden has said what has happened you know, in the past couple of days, that is just a step. Congress needs to act. The European Union is getting ready to act. China has already acted. The UK, on the other hand, has said it has no intent on rushing towards regulation. But the Americans are saying what we need to do is pre-test these systems. It seems to me, and I, and I I'm, you know, the ignoramus here, but, but it seems to me these machines are going to grow and develop exponentially. They'll become smarter over time. Yeah. So pre-testing is only a snapshot in time. It, it doesn't necessarily relate to where these systems are going, does it? It doesn't relate to where they're going, and it also doesn't acknowledge the fact that so many of these systems are already out and about right now, making decisions and distributing algorithmic harms to people right now. So AI is being used in the British civil service, it's being used in the United States by the US government, it's being used by companies. Most of us are on the receiving end of AI and don't even know it. That's a problem for democracy. It's also gonna be a problem if we are looking at elections in terms of misinformation, deep fakes, all of that. So it's not just these big models that are coming down the pipe in the next 18 to 24 months that's freaking some people out. It's also what's already happening. So there's two types of risk, there's future risk, and then there's now risk. Yeah. Um, this is probably, as you say, the most defining moment in technology since 1940 in the development of Alan Turing's machine, the, which was, the, of course, the forerunner to, to modern computing. So 
it is perhaps only right that the new technology has created an ode to the godmother, Betty Webb, uh, who is now 100 years old. This is her. She worked at Bletchley Park during World War II. The poem was written by Chat GPT, and here she is reading it. In Bletchley's hallowed halls where secrets lay, a lady named Betty Webb in wartime's fray. She toiled in shadows, a silent, steadfast star, unveiling cryptic mysteries from near and far. With grace and brilliance... You can watch the full poem on the BBC website. It's amazing, Stephanie, that she didn't actually know what ChatGPT was and she grew up in the country without a car or a phone. But, you know, what strikes me is, is how far we've come in Betty's lifetime. How far do you think we will be in another Betty lifetime, in another 100 years' time? I mean, if Elon Musk has his way, he'll be dying on Mars. So, you know, <laughs> it's as big as we can dream at the moment as a species, I guess. Yeah, I guess you're right. I, I mean, look how far, as you say, we've come in six months. A hundred years from now, our, our world will be turned upside down. Maybe not even this world, as you say. Maybe we'll be standing on another. Who knows? Listen, that's it. We're out of time. Uh, we will do this again same time next week. And, of course, we'll get into all the stories around the world relating to AI. Dr Stephanie Hare, uh, thank you very much for being with us on this first edition of AI Decoded. Thank you.